One of the problems with recruiting for investment banking is not the knowledge or skills you acquire, but the access to talk with real investment bankers to put your best foot forward. Our sponsor, WSO Academy, can provide those connections with 60 head mentors who are finance professionals at top firms like Goldman, Centerview, and JP Morgan. Imagine being able to get on the phone within 24 hours with one of the Academy's 1,300 mentors right before a critical interview. Get on the waitlist for WSO Academy today by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting wallstreetoasis.com slash academy. Welcome to Investment Banking Insights. This is the only show dedicated to helping you learn both the technical and non-technical aspects of investment banking. My name is Alex Mason and I am your host. I'm so grateful that you're joining me today, giving me your time and attention. I really appreciate it. And we're all about investment banking here. We're talking about now discounted cash flows, getting into the nitty gritty of some of the more nuanced, more advanced aspects of a DCF. And so I'm grateful to talk about today's question. But before we get to that, I do have a small minor announcement. I just want to celebrate the fact that this show has officially reached 100,000 downloads, 100,000 total downloads, which if you know anything about the podcast world, like that's incredible. That is incredible. The show has only been in existence for five months and you all are just really just listening a lot and the show has been growing and i'm really appreciative of that as a veteran podcaster and i don't think i've ever mentioned this on the show but i have another podcast that i've run for a few years it it took me i think two two to three years of running that other show to get to 100,000 downloads so just the fact that this show has grown so much in such a short period of time i am really grateful thank you for listening thank you for sharing this with other people who you think will benefit from this information and insight. Uh, just want to make that quick announcement. I'm just very grateful. And uh, yeah, let's keep it, keep it going <laughs> on our way to a million. So let's go ahead and talk about today's question, which is related to discounted cash flow. How do you account for stub periods in a DCF? How do you account for stub periods in a DCF? Now, of course, as you know, I love to do, we always like to to define things first on the show before we get into the nitty gritty logic, because I think most of finance is really just understanding what things mean. And so let's go ahead and talk about what is a stub period. A stub period refers to when you change your calculations to reflect a partial period of time. So instead of a full period of time, like year one, year two, year three, a stub period reflects a partial period. So maybe three months or six months or seven months. So let's say that it's March 31st when you're valuing a company. You're working as a banker, you're valuing this company, you're building a DCF, and it's March 31st. And the company has already generated some cash flow for the first quarter of that year, right? The first three months. Now, the remainder of the year between April 1st and December 31st of the current year is called the stub period, the stub period. So the remainder of the year, it's not a full year, but just a partial called the stub period. So what you do is you take the number of days left in the year, divide it by 365, 275 days are between April 1st and December 31st. So you divide 275 divided by 365, which gives you just about 75%. So if you're using the standard convention in terms of time in your discounted cash flow model, your periods look like this, 0.75, then 1.75, then 2.75, 3.75, et cetera. And this would make sense, right? Because you start with 0.75 because you're already a quarter into the year. So the cash flows of the business that you're assuming that you're projecting out into the future, remember DCFs are a forward-looking mechanism. You are assuming 0.75 for that first year as that stub period. Then you add one to it for the next year, 1.75 and so on and so forth. 
Okay, so that's an explanation, basic explanation of a stub period and how it works with the conventional model. Now let's go ahead and say that you're using the mid-year convention. How do things change in your DCF model when you use the mid-year convention? Well, it's similar to the logic that you use when you have a mid-year convention without a stub period. Remember how we assume for a mid-year convention that the cash flow arrives in the middle of the period. Remember that 0.5, 1.5 years, 2.5 years, et cetera. That was our convention. Well, now that we have the stub period and we assume that the cash flow starts on April 1st of the year, what we do is we take that stub period, our 0.75, technically it's 0.753. And so we take 0.753 and divide it by two. We just cut it in half. So 0.753 divided by two is equal to 0 0.376. Okay, now stay with me now. So we have this 0.376. This is the halfway point between April 1st and December 31st. So what we're doing is we're getting the mid-year convention for this smaller period of time. Now this happens to be the 227th day of the year or August 15th in normal non-leap years. So we're basically saying that, all right, we're starting to value the company on April 1st. We're gonna evaluate it through the stub period, which is all the way through December 31st. And if we're using the mid-year convention, instead of taking the middle of the entire fiscal year, like January 1st through December 31st, for example, we're gonna take the middle of the stub period. So halfway between April 1st and December 31st, which is August 15th. And so that's why we take that 0.753 and divide it by two to get 0.376. So what do we then do with that number? So because we're looking at the first period of our DCF model, we're using that period of 0.376. And what we're gonna do is in subsequent years, we're going to add the entire stub period of 0.753 plus 0 0.5 to account for the fact that we expect cash flows to arrive halfway through year two. So in this case, so we've got year one, 0 0.7, 3, 376, excuse me. And then what do we have for year two? So it would be 0 0.376, which is what we start at in year one, plus we add the 0 0.753, which is the entirety of the stub period, plus we add 0 0.5 because that 0 0.5 accounts for the fact that we expect the cash flows to arrive halfway through year two and that leaves us with a number of 1.629 so let me just review that really quickly because i'm throwing a lot of numbers around and sometimes with audio it's just really hard to like wrap at least for me wrap my head around numbers <laughs> so i need to again this point three seven six that represents the halfway the midpoint of the stub period now for year two we add in 0.753 the entirety of the stub period plus 0 0.5 to account for the fact that cash flows will be received halfway through the second year you got it so that gives you 1.629 and then if we were to move on and project this out for year three what number do we use for year three well, it's just year two's period length plus one. So we just add one. So 1 1.629 for year three plus one then becomes 2.629. And then this continues on and on for year four or five, et cetera, throughout the length of our DCF calculations. So what are we getting at here? We're getting at the fact that the timing of cash flows matters. You can see by running these calculations how the nuances of when you count cash flows affects your overall discounted cash flow calculations. Stub periods allow you to more accurately forecast future cash flows by considering the amount of money a firm has already received in its fiscal year by the time that you're doing the calculation. Remember, everything's not going to be exactly perfect and lined up when you're valuing businesses for clients, right? You may get thrown into a situation where you're valuing a business on April 1st or on March 17th, and you need to understand how those cash flows 
can be more accurately reflected in your model based on reality. So that's all we're trying to do here. So using the mid-year convention, in addition to this concept of the stub period, is it also helps you project cash flows assuming they come in in a more smooth manner. So halfway through the period or year, for example, instead of at the end of the period or year. And this makes more sense because most businesses on average, they're just going to have cash coming in day after day, week after week, month after month. And it's going to be lumpy, certainly, especially for cyclical businesses. But overall, we can assume that cash flows come in at a relatively even pace. And that gives us a little bit more clarity as opposed to assuming that cash flows come in at the very end of every year. So that's a little bit more of a nuanced, advanced concept of how we can think about the timing of cash flows in our DCF model. Think about stub periods and also think about using the mid-year convention. And then, of course, when we combine those two concepts, we get an even more nuanced, accurate picture of how a company may produce its cash flow going forward. Okay, thanks for sticking with me through all that, going through all those numbers. I really appreciate you, and thank you so much for listening. This is what I got for you today here on Investment Banking Insights. I hope you're having an incredible day, and I look forward to talking to you next time. All right, take care.